Nuno, welcome to the All Things Risk podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on the program, and it's going to be a, a fun conversation. I already know it, so welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. I really appreciate for your invite here. Thank so you. I always ask my guests at the beginning to maybe tell my listeners, especially new guests, people who've not been on the show before, to share a little bit about who they are and, and what they do. And I always say, please feel free to take as much time to explain that uh, and be as windy as you would like, because the most interesting people tend to have the most nonlinear trajectories in careers and in life. So, uh, but mm -hmm. how? If it's, tell us a little bit about you know, who you are and what, what you do. That'd be a great place to start. No, absolutely. So uh, maybe it's just a quick uh, background. I'm originally from uh, Portugal, Lisbon, but I have uh, left uh, uh, the country when I was around 23 to come to England. Uh, I've done my studies predominantly in astrophysics. Uh, that was in, uh, when I was uh, in Portugal. And then I moved to more of the high energy, like all these uh, string theory. And I'm not sure if uh, people are aware, but it's all this kind of uh, very fancy theories to understand universe and in a way the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, more on the scientific side. Uh, so I've done all that studies in uh, Cambridge, Oxford, uh, and so on. Um, but at, at some point, you know, uh, you also have to pay yes. your bills, right? And you also yes. make a living. Uh, and there was a very restricted in terms of um, continuing your research uh, as in this area. Uh, very, very competitive and very few places to do it at a high level. Um, so, you know, as many others, uh, decided to move mm -hmm. to the finance. So it was a time as well where the investment banks and the hedge funds were hiring people, uh, with all these uh, studies of mathematics mm -hmm. and physics. So I was uh, one of them, right? So making the transition from, uh, the, the physics, the theoretical physics, uh, to the, the banking, internal investment banking to do all these, uh, fancy flex on financial mm -hmm. derivatives. Um, so I started that in uh, 2004. Um, could say it was like, probably the top of the years uh, before the mm. crisis uh, coming out. So you can see a lot of uncertainty as well coming forward in that my career. So I stay for 18 years working finance uh, in different uh, positions, even in different uh, asset classes. Uh, and uh, without getting into much details, I had like experience both as a mm. quant, which is the quantifying in a way, the mm. risk and uncertainty, but also on the trading, which is like the application of that in, in a more practitioner and then also as an intersection between the two, which is called a financial engineer, mm -hmm. and then later on the business manager. So I had like a, a different intersections, mm -hmm. a different uh, experience uh, in finance, mostly on the tech and the investment banking. Uh, and then after these 18 years, I was already looking into terms of making a transition in terms of uh, solopreneurship or entrepreneurship. It was like the thing that uh, I was getting in fact, starting with the leadership, that was back in uh, 2008, uh, reading uh, Ray Dalio, The Principles, mm -hmm. was kind of this book that made me open my eyes in uh, different uh, levels. So, you know, starting this slowly, my plan, you know, the exit plan, yeah. five years exit plan, mm -hmm. it landed up to uh, become then a mm -hmm. solopreneur. And then I was in uh, August 2000, um, uh, uh, 22, mm -hmm. sorry. And so it has well one year and a half. Uh, and that I created, like, initially I was looking more in terms of um, helping people in their careers, uh, helping people that were in a similar situation as mine in terms of getting promotion. But it was working, never fulfilling that part because I was interacting with people that, you know what, now I got my promotion, I got my pay rise, I don't care much about this story of personal development and so on and so on. And it was like something that it was, I was not fully fulfilling mm. as well on my side. And it was actually in a kind of exploratory going into the uncertainty mm -hmm. level that I realized that keyword, the keyword of uncertainty was really like the one mm -hmm. thing that connect pretty much all my different experience from academic, mm -hmm. finance, even on entrepreneurship that made me realize, okay, this is the subject. Mm -hmm. This is the, the area that I wanted to uh, build my business and be like the one that speaks about uncertainty. And therefore, I made like the founding of the University of Uncertainty, mm -hmm. uh, which is a bit of a contradiction. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to go into in the more detail, but it's basic to give an experience as well to people, uh, as well the tools and all the kind of ways of thinking about going into the what I call the valley of uncertainty of the mm -hmm. unknown. There's nothing to do 
with setting goals, having a curriculum, mm -hmm. uh, doing some kind of an exam or getting a certificate. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to do as well with the, the, the typical coaching where like all this kind of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, accountability and uh, be a better in performance, high mm -hmm. performance. Yes, I do high performance, like we probably talk mm -hmm. about that. But uncertainty is actually not only a very interesting uh, topic, but very mm -hmm. challenging, uh, and it can have huge ramifications across okay. um, subjects. And I'm more on the personal level, mm. from you know, from the individual, than I have mm. repercussions in terms of their mm. work, their lives, their organizations, their business, and so on. Can you? So that's a bit of myself. Sure. Could you talk a little bit more about how did you come to the realization that uncertainty was the, one of the themes that kind of held together your, mm. your work? Like what it was, how did that mm -hmm. come about? Like it was a moment of serendipity. What was, if you could just mm -hmm. describe that, was there a process of some type that facilitated that some mm -hmm. reflection, mm -hmm. some techniques? So what was it that led you to, conclude mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. uncertainty was the key concept. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I believe at the end of the day, maybe has been a serendipity, uh, kind of a moment, uh, as well, a collection of uh, a lot of uh, trying to find mm -hmm. research. Now, specifically as to when it happened during that time, I will say it was when I was looking to improve my writing. Mm. So I was part of uh, a course, it's called kind of related to category pi or something about that, but it's, uh, it's to write mm. better, right? So, but the course actually was more than that. It was actually to understand who do we want to be uh, mm. perceived and, uh, and what kind of a directions we wanted mm. to be on the branding mm. or we want to be more on creating something as it's called the camp, okay. right? So the branding is where most people are going through, but the other one is much more challenging. And for that, you really need to find what is going to be unique about mm. you uh, that you can create mm. something new. So there was about that kind of... Uh, I would have to say when I when I saw that like path A path B in a way, I immediately said, okay, this is the one I wanted to go, uh, and this is one I wanted to come up with mm -hmm. something, and it was like more on the process. So it was a kind of catalyst mm -hmm. in a way to recognize there was that possibility mm -hmm. or path, and once you know there's a possibility, and then you actually start to mm -hmm. explore, and there was a lot of uh, exploration, and it's continued to be obviously, uh, but now it's coming into more on a converging mm -hmm. area, so. Okay. And what did you want to be when you were younger? I mean, what, what led you to mathematics and was that related to something that you wanted to be or was it, uh, what, what, when it, what was the younger Nuno? What did, what did he want wow, to uh, achieve or be or ideas or? Well, yeah, I, I was a terrible student, by the way. So I probably like my very first thing I wanted to be was to be a fireman because I like mm. to fire. <laughs> so that was a, hey, the first right. answer right but I, I was always like very terrible mm. student so i was very bored with the mm. classes i don't want to memorize all these uh, types of triangles mm. and it's just terrible and i was just like doing the minimal so that i don't have to go through the mm. same mm. process the same you know listening to the same things so i was just like advertising mm. my effort to not mm. fail <laughs> but at the same time i was actually reading a lot of uh, mm. books uh, so this was like when i was 10 okay. 11 12 books on quantum mechanics and cosmology, uh, which I could not understand most of that. But I was then all the sudden reading things of works of the greatest scientists like Richard mm -hmm. Feynman, Albert Einstein, and, and so on and so on about really this very technical, in a way, understanding the, the universe uh, from the very cosmology to the quantum mechanics. I was reading this stuff, right? And even I was not making mm -hmm. sense of all of that, I was capturing key interest. And I was actually one, probably I'll say, I was much more passion or much more driven by the depth of the knowledge mm. than the superficiality. Mm. Even if I could not understand the depth, that's where I would like mm. to go. Superficiality for me, as well as I always struggle okay. with that. Uh, so moving forward, Obviously, again, I had to make my living because I could not longer be a terrible student. Yeah. Otherwise, I would mm. fail miserably. Everybody was saying, if you continue this path, I will not even be able to go to uni, not even probably get a mm. proper job. And it was like a transition uh, around the, when I was 16 um, that I, you know what, I'm just going to be the best student. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't spoke for with mm -hmm. anyone 
and this was like total silence. I was just focused on my studies for three, six mm. months. You know, like was becoming this weird mm. kid. Uh, but it, it was like kind of a transformation in a way, uh, and it was building like the base uh, for what's going after. Then, right. You know, ten years yeah. after, I was becoming like from the worst student to uh, the guy who was a PC in mathematics. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and studied at Oxford in string theory. By the way, can you explain string theory simply? <laughs> like, what, what is it? It's, uh, it's actually very interesting because uh, it has been uh, almost uh, 40 years that comes the way the idea. So this is about the ideas of trying to unify all the known forces between, say, particularly the gravity with all the other forces. Okay. So uh, without getting into much mm -hmm. jargon, the idea is like, oh, if you can think about a particle not as a point, but as a string, there are certain um, dynamics or certain features that allows to make this kind of unification of quantifying gravity in a way with the other hmm. you know like other forces and make it as a, as a single theory of the everything okay. right, that was supposed to be explaining all the the things including you know um, before the big hmm. bang apparently but it's also very interesting because and it's like something that's appropriate to the listeners will emphasize this to their own work because it's become kind of i'll not say a dogma but it's becoming quite predominantly to be the only type of science or the only type of model uh, that the funding, uh, all the money is going into that, mm. right? So there was no choice, to be quite oh. frank. When I went to, uh, say, doing a PhD, it was the, everybody was doing that and everybody is doing that. So even if there are other potential models and other kind of uh, approach that could do something else in parallel, most of the opportunities is only on string okay. theory. When I say, obviously, string theory is a huge branch, but there's like this a bit of when you can start to think of what is really mm -hmm. science. Is really science that we are doing here or is more about a dogmatic mm -hmm. way, you know, like funding and all these kind of things that is trying to force something that may not even be mm -hmm. possible. So it goes deeper in actually... Mm -hmm the understanding of how humans operate these days in everything that we talk all the time. Okay, interesting. And it would be, perhaps if we just touch on a little bit your time in, in banking. Yeah. So you spent time in, I guess it, it was foreign exchange and um, you worked for a big investment bank credit, credit as well. You worked at Bloomberg also. And I'm just wondering how some of you are thinking, like what 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 is the uncertainty angle or the uncertainty peace if uncertainty is kind of a unifying theme to some of your work what what did you learn especially in you know the the global financial crisis or post financial crisis um what mm -hmm. what did you take away on uncertainty and decision making maybe mm -hmm. that you learned from your time in the banking mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. yeah uh, it's uh mm -hmm. It's very interesting, and I'm not going into like the technical sure. models and so on, and so on, because I wanted to give probably a, a different perspective of what people already know, and in terms of the crisis and so on, and and in a parallel with the, even like string theory and this dogma that uh, mm. we we're already talking about, I would say like, and by the way, I started like in credit in a way, so all these toxic products that mm. were, you know, supposed to be uh, the cause of mm -hmm. the crisis in 2008. So I was participating in a way, mm. some of that. But what I wanted to mention is like, I think like the very first time that I went to investment banking, and obviously I was one of these ones mm. to quantify the uncertainty. And there's a huge confusion. Okay. There's a huge confusion between the uncertainty yes. and the risk. Right? Uh, the uncertainty are the things actually you cannot quantify. So, mm. so what, they, what they are doing is risk, which is like what you yes. can quantify. So that's the first thing. And what is cannot be quantified is simply almost ignored. Even after all these uh, works of the black mm -hmm. swans and even after the credit crunch and so on and so on, mm -hmm. it's, sub it's, it's simply being ignored and it continues to be ignored. So even like Risk Magazine, which is the top magazine for the financial mm -hmm. industry of derivatives, rarely, rarely they talk about the true uncertainty, which is what cannot be quantified. Open a certain risk magazine is pretty much the quantified right. element. That's right. the first thing. The second thing, it was like obviously when I went there, it was 2004. A lot of things mm -hmm. have changed, right? I'm not going to mention also like the names that I mm -hmm. track and so on, but uh, it depends also a lot of 
particular people you're talking, I had like this perception is like coming from high advanced science in a way, going into the models of the banks. And it was not just the, mo- it was not the models per se. It was like the culture okay. of the thinking. And I was looking, am I back now 300 years? Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Because it seems like people here, they're like, are we back to Newtonian? Okay. <laughs> could you, could you explain you know? that a little bit more? Because yeah. it was mm-hmm. such a, Hmm. I will just tell uh, maybe a bit of a, sure. a quick story because that credits hmm. models. People say they could not see hmm. it happening. Not actually truth, right? Some of us actually could see mm-hmm. it happening. There was a big mess coming up. Right? I was a junior guy there. Okay, fair enough. I had a PhD and so on. I was, you know, reasonable understanding mathematics and so on, but I was hmm. a junior. And they put me like to work, wanted to put me to work on these models mm. and so on. I start to ask mm. questions, right? So in science, you ask questions. So I was, I was mm. asking questions. How is this kind of work? I mean, if something is going to default here, then it's not going to mm. collapse everything, you know, like a domino. <laughs> no, 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 it's perfect. So this was like talking to senior quant, like the heads, you know, and so on. And, and they were completely blind. They were saying, no, it's no problem at all. You know, if, if something is going to default, we still have 124 names to default. So this is actually this is the ultimate unified mm-hmm. <laughs> model in terms of finance of a mm-hmm. product that will create unlimited uh, prosperity. Mm-hmm. And, and this was like a dogma. It, it was not that they were like trying to hide. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Maybe other people were trying to hide, but there was like self, a huge self deception because of the way of thinking. Mm-hmm. And this like, and by the way, this self-deception, it is perhaps in a way happening as well with the string theory and many other areas. And this is like where I come from the uncertainty mm-hmm. because people want to be sure. certain. And the worst case that you want it to be certain is when you are surrounded by uncertainty. <laughs> so why not just say, I don't mm-hmm. know, let's explore, mm-hmm. let's be open, let's, uh, you know, but the pressure is particular in a financial institution, at least at the time, and it is is Mm. obviously still the case. It is so much that you have to be certain at some point because otherwise you don't make the deals. There's like the competition. If you don't make these deals, other one will do it. And there's like this huge political pressure and so on. But on top of that, there was a Mm self-deception right, going on. And and a few ones like they could wanted to ask Mm -hmm. questions, they were, uh, you know, put apart. Okay. Uh, I had like almost little power as a junior. So then I move away. I want just to get away from this credit. Mm-hmm. That's why I went and then to rates and effect and so on, because I didn't mm-hmm. want to get any involved with that. And so then mm-hmm. I move away. So that's just a, a bit of a story. Right. Uh, and what did you see when the crisis was unfolding? Like, did those people, did you talk mm-hmm. to, have interactions with some of the same people who said, oh, there's no problem? This is, uh, you know, unlimited prosperity. No, they, they, they're, they're gone. gone. Yeah. Most of them, they, they're gone. I mean, they, they have made, the, you know, their, yeah. their uh, money. And, uh, you know, that's, yeah. and then the rest of us, that's that say, you know, they have to Met. clean up all the, the, yeah. the mess, basically. So uh, then I end up, uh, you know, like years mm. uh, to going on and really pretty mm. much uh, cleaning up uh, the mess because it was the years mm. where people realized that the things have to be improved. And, uh, and then I went yeah. then to, you know, the Bloomberg, that's, not necessarily just banging, but that was like where the system where then we provide this service mm-hmm. to be independent, to make it a more clarity in the mm-hmm. market. So that was really the foundation why I wanted to move to the Bloomberg mm-hmm. because it becomes a bit more independent mm-hmm. of all this uh, kind of uh, self yeah, illusion. Interesting. In so, yeah, uh, I, I'm going to link uh, to something completely different here. This, well, this is sometimes what we do on this show, but when you were talking, you I latched onto the thing that you said about, you know, you, when, you are in the middle of uncertainty. You, you, people cling to things that are certain. There's, there, there are parallels to other things. Um, and one of the ones that I thought about while you were describing that was, I don't know if you ever had the, well, of course you did. You, you, you have the experience of living in another culture. Um, I, I've, as I've done mm-hmm. as well over the years. And sometimes when that happens, Particularly, you know, people who've worked as an expatriate, for example, this, this can happen, I guess, where you, you sometimes you make friends with people in, like, it's in another, like you're in another culture, but you make a, 
a, a friend, a friend who you probably wouldn't otherwise be friends with, but only because there's, you, you know, mm. there's, oh, so-and-so comes from a similar or the same culture as, as I do. Mm. And it's just easier or there's, there's almost a clinging or even mm. sometimes, and sometimes this can be helpful as well, because sometimes when you're learning something new, you can latch on to, if, for example, a language, right? You can learn, you can latch on to certain concepts that mm -hmm. are um, similar to yours to try to make sense of something new. Um, so there's a, mm -hmm. there's, there's mm -hmm. probably a point where that's, it's healthy to latch on to certain things that, that give you, you know, certainty. Like there's, there's, there's something that mm -hmm. is helpful if it allows you mm -hmm. to navigate through new waters. But sometimes it's not healthy because you're clinging to something as a truth that isn't true. Or for example, you, you, you've, you've met someone who is, you think is like a new best friend, but actually you're just, you, you probably have very little in common outside of that context. You're just in the same boat mm -hmm. temporarily. Um, and they're not new, your new best friend. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I was just, I was just thinking, um, about mm -hmm. the concept of navigating uncertainty because you say, you know, there's a big difference between uncertainty and risk. Um, it's something that people, uh, in, mm -hmm. even in the risk space don't get some people that are not in the risk space. They assume that the mm -hmm. people that analyze risk or assess risk, that that's all there is, but it's not. There's all this stuff that, you know, that comes out that we can't analyze. We can't assess. We can't identify even, um, until it, it sort of, it sort of happens. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, that's long winded. I realize, uh, it, I, I'm just uh, <laughs> wanting to get some of your perspectives around how to navigate, make decisions in an environment where there is high uncertainty right. and, I don't know if you agree with me that there's sometimes there's a line between clinging on to some certainties versus not. So I, I presume that there is, right? So like sometimes like we know there are certain scientific laws that, you know, we know that, you know, law of gra whatever mm -hmm. gravity, whatever the thing is, we know that this is, this is a, how something actually, something works or maybe not, maybe as a, as a string theorist, maybe it's like, it's not, uh, but there, there, there are probably some techniques to, you know, use what you know to figure out what you don't know. And then there's, a point where that gets unhealthy mm -hmm. anyway that's no absolutely i mean obviously we, we don't want everything to be mm -hmm. uncertain right but we also need to understand that uh things are not are never going to be certain even mm -hmm. science people right. say okay but science gives us this certainty does science, it yeah because actually by the history yeah. of science and when did science provide something that was mm -hmm. certain is it, actually what provides well, the tool for people exactly so, science, science is a science mode of inquiry well. it's not it's not um it, mm. it it's a way of you know it's a processes and 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 you know scientific knowledge is revised the all the time mm -hmm. that they're like the methodologies mm -hmm. and the deductive mm -hmm. and creativity so there's all these kind of things the tools mm -hmm. and the process and so on that sure. makes science but the the, the actual uh, any model that says to be scientific and says to be certain 100 mm -hmm. that's by definition is not uh, anymore a scientific model because scientific model actually wanted to be in a way that can be yeah. rejected right so that is really the purpose of the science. But obviously, you wanted to have some uh, signposts, some kind of uh, ways mm -hmm. that you have some level of uh, pillars mm -hmm. in a way to uh, proceed to the mm -hmm. next level. And so that is like when people uh, talk about quantifying uncertainty, what they are trying to do is, uh, well, let me do this subjective, mm -hmm. which is uncertainty, to objective, which is the mm -hmm. numbers, and then I can fit into my uh, models and then I can become like my mm -hmm. decisions, which is like, a bit what uh, this Bayesian... Yeah, uh, get on to that, uh, yeah. We mm. have time mm -hmm. for that. Uh, the, it was actually the initial purpose was exactly mm -hmm. that, to make decisions in a better way uh, under uncertainty. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and it works. It works to some mm -hmm. extent, right? Problem here is, is when it becomes a dogma, mm -hmm. right? When people start to question. So I'm not like, I'm not advocate, okay, we have to question mm -hmm. everything, but we should in a way. But, you know, we have to also have common sense. And the other part is this... To me, a huge fragmentation, not only our knowledge, but also how people mm. think of. Uh, it's a consequence of the complexity of the world. It's very difficult to find someone that has a, a broad and good understanding in the in different areas, right? And what we see is like these hyper specialization mm. areas, right? Or, or jobs or works that makes things more and more mm. fragmented. So you become quite objective in that concept in that kind of uh, tools and so on mm. but you lose the context mm. you are losing your common sense you are losing your 
kind of native in a way ways to navigate so-called navigate mm. your, or explore the uncertainty which is beyond just the quantifying mm. things for example and i just mentioned this one because i think that's where people actually resonate the most, which is like this negative capability. I'm not sure if you no explain that heard about explain this. That, it's basically please, yeah. coming from. Okay, I only mentioned mm-hmm. this one because actually uh, that's what people once they understand this actually resonates. Yes. So it actually was a, a John Keats, a poet, uh, in, an English poet, and in one of his letters to his brothers, he mentioned about this negative capability, which to him was kind of. Uh, the secret mm-hmm. sauce, as in modern uh, words, of Shakespeare. Mm. And what that means is like this ability to sit on uncertainty mm. without having the urge or even like that anxiety, that need to fall into a certain the okay. certainty. To be in that level of uncertainty without having the urge to get into a, 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 an mm-hmm. answer. And that is like to him it was like kind of the the secret of the ability of Shakespeare mm. to be in that level of uncertainty on what to say, what to speak. Then, then when you realize something is a kind of, you can think as well as, as a power source for in, intuition mm-hmm. or insight, then you can realize, okay, no, I can actually, I can understand a bit more what I can say in terms of Shakespeare, the words that mm-hmm. you wanted to put together. But it was like kind of a, a tool of creativity. Mm-hmm. And it actually sees, and this is what is another component, See the uncertainty as uh, a positive yes. thing, right? Because everybody, like McKinsey, there was legal reports. We yeah. need to crunch yes. uncertainty. Yes, make everything we certain. Yes. We need to quantify. Mm-hmm. We need to manage. Yeah, we need to mm-hmm. control. And okay, you know, but mm-hmm. why you always see mm-hmm. uncertainty mm-hmm. always in these mm-hmm. negative aspects? You know, it's like the same old in the psychology yeah. before World War II. It was only to. Uh, make yeah. people to suffer yes. less but then there's like the positive psychology that actually made it happen yeah it's a bit Great like stuff. that it's just shift yeah on. yeah so without getting too much so no yeah. I, I i i love it like uh <laughs> one of the things um and and one of my um aspects of my own personal philosophy which i have to remember sometimes is to embrace this concept of embrace uncertainty and there are some like you you mentioned creativity right Ultimately, play is mm-hmm. that, right? What, when you feel safe in uncertainty, you feel like there's no, there's, in some ways, play, there's no purpose in play. Um, you know, true, true play, like play, make believe or improvisation, like I- I- improv in comedy or the, these kinds of things. Um, that's embracing uncertainty. And that's, that's almost in some ways, it's a, so it's a childlike state, but also in like in Zen Buddhism, it's, it's beginner's mind too, when there's all, possibilities are endless and lose that so the modern world almost beats us mm-hmm. beats that out of us because you know we work in organizations we need to make structured decisions so we we have to structure everything mm-hmm. and we then i think it affects us right like as we grow older we we, we, we start mm-hmm. to fear uncertainty um and actually certainty is sold right as the as a good thing so it's um, there's maybe fear is uh, connected to fear and certainty. Fear and uncertainty is kind of a connected, mm. a connected thing. So I completely, I, well, I feel like I, I understand where you're, um, you're, you're coming from here. Uh, and it's, um, but in the modern world, it's very challenging because all the structures are about inducing uncertainty. Uncertainty is a negative thing. Uh, going back to science, mm-hmm. and I've used this analogy before is that you need, there is creativity in science. So where does a hypothesis come from that you generate hypotheses mm-hmm. through, you know, maybe you have some interesting mm-hmm. thoughts mm-hmm. on that, but like, mm-hmm. you know, knowledge advances through embracing yeah. uncertainty. Um, we advance brace, embracing uncertainty. I'll probably even take a, 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 leap, a, a okay. leap forward on that, even like the nature itself mm-hmm. and uh, without getting into, again, I'm mm-hmm. really trying to get mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. jargon free, but Quantum mm-hmm. mechanics, right? There's a there's an inherent uncertainty in nature. Okay. You cannot like mirror the, the particles. Yeah. You know, what it says is that currently, most likely, what is looking is like if it wasn't for that level of inherent mm-hmm. in nature. Talking about the nature mm-hmm. here of the world, probably we will not be here or here, mm-hmm. right? So that's kind of the source of uh, the universe itself, in a way. So it, without getting into much, mm-hmm. you know, uh, too deep or mm-hmm. What I'm trying to say here is that currently, if it wasn't that for that level of uncertainty, we will not even mm. be here. 
So how can that be negative, mm. right? So yeah, there is also the negative aspect, but also in the, the positive one. So that is like the the, the framework in terms of the nature. The, the other thing about the the hypothesis, right? all that kind of uh, uh, creativity or imagination. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that is part of people starting to not only be curious, but also be uncertain of, uh, well, it's actually like the the sun that rotates around the earth. Is it mm. so? You know, but then you are starting questions about these kind of things and what does it create? It creates uncertainty. Mm. I mean, Galileo, or uh, I'm sure it lived through a huge uncertainty when he was challenging uh, the the dogmas at yeah. the time. So, uh, but then there's like this clash. Mm. There's the organization. And you can see the parallels mm. here, right? As much as we don't want to see the parallels, you can see mm. the parallels because how many Galileos, in a way, are in living in uh, institutions that are being, uh, you know, uh, quiet uh, by the dogmas of mm. that institution because it's a business as usual. They wanted to operate. They wanted to shake the things up. And and there are mm. people in organizations that they wanted to mm. question, but they are not being allowed mm. in a way. So yeah. It's very difficult. <laughs> it's yeah, it's very difficult. I've uh, been speaking to some organizations or trying to talk about the limitations of traditional risk management, but also um, the, I've co-written a book about the state of the world. And the problem is that the world doesn't care about the organizational structures of, or the institutional structures of anything, right? Shit just happens. <laughs> and it doesn't neatly fall into the purview of <laughs> certain whatever departments or what have you and if it did then something's kind of kind of wrong <laughs> or uh so so mm. that's the problem with like you know managing uncertainty managing risk or managing uncertain trying to manage uncertainty it's like it doesn't it, it's the world's messy it doesn't neatly corresponds to how you've mm. organized your mm. company or how we've organized our lives and that's part and parcel of mm. life that's part and parcel of reality and you may even question if this a uh, lot of this uncertainty isn't caused by us mm. as well, right? To be trying to be certain, mm. does it create actually more uncertainty mm. by trying to be certain? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Question. Mm. Uh, a lot of these things that in personal level, it's uh, that mm. helped me to tremendous. Uh, one of the mm. areas is actually understanding what I call the anthropology of things. What it means is like understanding wh where these ideas mm. come from. How 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 come we we become so logical? Mm. How become how can we how become like we we link reason being rational mm. to be uh the quantified where, where these things come from you know when did it start the world to start to think in this way but those who obviously have time and be curious they start to understand these ideas have been kind of well before in the consequence of before of uh, then it goes to the, you know the greek mm. philosophers and so on but by understanding like our testers in terms of the mm -hmm. thinking, you actually start to understand. I put in a kind of a metacognition, like actually mm -hmm. to understand why you're thinking that mm -hmm. way, and we why we come up to to thinking this way, and and why we starting to you know self deception mm -hmm. like that, quantifying uncertainty is the answer. Mm -hmm. And I think it helped me a mm -hmm. lot because not only it helped me understanding my kind of limits of the thinking, but also understanding the limits of the thinking of the other people. Right. And now it's becoming much more clear right. that that people are just is, is a lot of the things are being certain where they should not yes. be and they are probably even a certain where they could not necessarily be yes. and and it's a kind of a, a what do you call metacognition type of mm. skill uh and it is very useful to mm. be quite frank if anything to be taken from here the kind of advice i don't like to provide advice mm. but anything is like to understand where the history mm -hmm. of thinking mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. The history of thinking, you, you're taking it at a much higher, farther level um, than typically I do in my in my work. Which is some, you know, I, I like to make sure that when I work with clients, that they they understand where certain practices where they come from, because you I, you need to understand the why in order to do it well, in order to understand the limitations, uh, rather than slavishly sort of religiously do it, which is it happens far too often and mm -hmm. le leads to problems. You're talking, you know, I think uh, at a at a meta level, which I think is uh, very useful because I think also that that can even get very, uh, almost get to a personal level or at least like, why am I dissatisfied in mm -hmm. my profession? Like, where is 
where's that coming from? Um, you know, in spite of salary, position, whatever, why am I dissatisfied? What, what, what's going on here? And you start to think about, well, the, you know, the structures of thinking, which I'd like to use now to take us on to Bayesian thinking. And mm-hmm. uh, you, you, so first of all, before we do that, um, I don't know if you had any thoughts on, on what I just said. Uh, okay. Absolutely. I mean, I, I totally, you, you, you touched base and I think you touched base before. And I, I actually wanted to say about that because this, this relation with mm. uncertainty, it, it goes beyond uh, models. Mm. It goes beyond the mm-hmm. quantifying. It, it actually is like almost a personal yes. relation. And therefore it is highly subjective. Mm-hmm. And therefore, it's more related to how you make sense mm. of the world, how you construct the narratives, right? So which goes well beyond all any type of quantified models. Mm-hmm. Uh, and actually, when I built my narrative of back in 2008, that I was kind of seeing that was what was coming mm. up, it was not because I was doing some kind of a modeling that was predicting that 2008 was going to happen in, in, in September. Well, nothing like that. Was, I was what I was doing. Looking back, I was building a narrative, making sense of certain behaviors, right. right? And that is like beyond any type of quantified uncertainty. It's actually making sense right. Right, of, of a narrative. Right. Uh, that was like to, to, to answer it here because it's actually mm. crucial. Uh, it's more coming from your sense, from your within, the interaction, right? So mind, body, all that mm-hmm. kind of things, mm-hmm. right? And is that, it is in a way what is also being lost in, uh, in institutions, mm-hmm. right? So we talk about uh, mindfulness and you go to uh, all these corporates and they give you an app for mindfulness. Well, yeah, but that's really, again, superficial in most cases, I'm sorry mm-hmm. to say, <laughs> because what we really wanted to do is really dive deeper mm-hmm. and actually understand these things in a much deeper level than give me yeah. an app on the mindfulness just to pick more. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It- yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, Sorry, I went a bit of of, of pageant here, yeah, but uh, I could not. Yeah, it's, it it makes uh, it makes I it makes sense to me. I, I get it almost. It's um, a tone. It's almost like a Zen, co- like you you know, um, you need to embrace uncertainty, but then you know you're getting you're given structures to you know. It's almost even when you yeah. your mindfulness is like how to do it, or um, when you're doing like people who are meditating, they. They sort of think I, I can't meditate because my mind wanders, and it's kind of like saying, "Well, that's kind of the point." Like it's kind of like saying, "I can't exercise because I get out of breath." Like I, you know, uh, you. It's a mm. yeah. It's it, anyway. There are loads of contradictions. Like I don't. I don't want to get too too far into um into into that. Uh, no, but it's just a quick mm. one because I think you wanted to t- you want to. You want to touch as this as mm-hmm. well because by proposing all oh, this, the mindfulness, this is the process. Yeah, this again, is the way. Like, this is the way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah. is the way, right? And actually, I I don't do. I I don't. You know, people can do it mindfulness, right? I mm-hmm. cannot do it. Mm-hmm. But I found my way of mindfulness in a way which is running, right? Right. right. So again, is from your personal experience, your trials yeah. and so on that. Just an aside, maybe you want to. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll come back to the, the running, the running piece. Um, uh, and we even, you know, the whole, but the concept of mindfulness, like there are so many traditions, right? There's so many ways of even meditation, mm-hmm. right? So there's no, there's, you know, there's, I, I'm not sure that there's a, a right or a wrong way, um, of, of doing this, right? And so sometimes it can be helpful for people to, use an app or something to introduce the concepts or to get into a practice or whatever, but that's not the be all and end all. all. And if you think that there's only, you know, one way or a right way of doing it, then, um, that's, mm-hmm. is, you know, not true. Anyway, uh, mm-hmm. let's go back to the, we'll come back to the whole running thing. Um, but mm-hmm. I want to get into mm-hmm. Bayesian thinking, Bayesian analysis. And, um, first of all, what is it? Because, and what link, like, what could this possibly have a link to what some of the things we're talking about? Well, this is a show about risk and uncertainty. I have people who listen to this who might have heard about uh, Monte Carlo analysis, right? Or risk mm-hmm. modeling or things like this. And I, mm-hmm. we were talking about this before I went on, we went live is that, um, I'm frustrated in the whole space of decision making and decision quality because you have people who think that if you quantify the shit out of everything, then that's what you, that's what this is. That's what that's good decision mm-hmm. is not. And so, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but let's just start with like Bayesian thinking. 
what is it and mm-hmm. yeah. where does it go wrong? What can you talk us through that? Mm-hmm. Uh, quickly, I mean, for uh, just uh, quickly, quickly, it's for uh, where it started. It was so Thomas Bay was like in the 70th uh, century mm-hmm. or so. Uh, don't put me mm-hmm. on that. This was 17 something. So it was like a statistician mm-hmm. or uh, like looking into these uh, statistical sure. uh, questions of uh, so called inverse probability. Well, what does it mean? Is like, if something happened, condition on something else, what is the probability of, of that knowing mm. the qualities of each event? What does it mean is that he, he found like a formula mm. and he, he was actually thinking that was not relevant. So he didn't even bother mm. to <laughs> publish that to others. And it was after his death that uh, a friend of him, uh, that he was like going through his work on the paperwork and secretary, found uh, that result. And, and good for him that he did not stole the idea, by the way. Uh, he mentioned as it was from his friend. Then he published, mm-hmm. okay, this is like this formula that is like all these conditional properties and so on and so on. Um, and then he started to understand like how powerful uh, that is in terms of when things are, again, not mm-hmm. certain. Uh, one typical example, so the audience can understand, is for example, in a way, this technique, the statistical technique was in a way used during the World War II when it was this enigma, uh, mm. cracking the, the enigma code of the you know the, the nazis and, and then it was like finding that in all messages uh, if you saw like this uh, movie uh that, that there was like this pattern that there was high little right basically in all messages they were starting like that and because of that they were able then to statistically uh, be able to speed up the the calculations mm-hmm. for like this huge machine mechanical machine prove that kind of uh, similar to Bayesian mm. process. So it was a way to, once you have, have some understanding, some potential understanding on, on something that is highly complex, it will speed up reverting, kind of decoding the rest in a much faster way. Mm. So it involves some kind of a priors without getting into much details. Mm. Basically, it is a very powerful tool. Mm-hmm. These days, uh, you know, a lot of the machine learning AI is under that kind of uh, mm-hmm. tools, mm-hmm. the Bayesian networks and so on. So anything that you're talking about AI clinically is through this Bayesian uh, that has developed over time. Okay. So very powerful, very powerful. Now, what happened is that it was around the 1950s where from call uh, expression that will, should be you know used for us the material stuff or the objective mm-hmm. things, we're talking about probabilities that there's like a mathematical understanding. Then uh, some statisticians, slash philosophers, mathematicians started to push the boundaries. Mm-hmm. Very good. These are talking about genius people, right? Mm-hmm. That, oh, let's make this probability as a concept, like away from what mathematics understands mm-hmm. and make it as a subjective belief. Okay. Now, now you have your, you, you, you change from a mathematical concept into personal. Now you're talking about your personal relation with the certainty. Well, there you go. The Bayesian okay. thinking itself, when it was created, it was precisely making that translation between something that is objective and something that is subjective. It's a personal belief. Okay, can, so this probability all of a sudden yeah. it was supposed to be. Can, yeah, right. can you just explain that a little bit a little bit more? Um something that's mathematical yeah. or something that's right. um subjective to object. Could you just explain explain that shift a little bit more? So so uh the very first thing that I can think of is uh, unfortunately is the politics. Okay. Right? Uh you have a certain beliefs, I have my certain mm-hmm. beliefs. Uh, and and because of that, your perception of the world uh, it's different from my okay. perception. Uh, and that is because it comes from your own subjective experience yeah. into the world yeah. Yeah. it's coming all from way out when you're yeah. born right so therefore you have your set of beliefs what they are saying is like because your set of beliefs are different from mine uh when you're going to ask oh who do you believe that the next elections is going to be yeah. you know regardless of all the information that you have there's always going to be an element that yeah. you your belief will sure. hear therefore your probability that you're going to say is different yeah. from my probability or maybe when it was like all this uh, catching that was like on the radical uh, uncertainty book uh, that is quite famous. Yes. They were counting this, the, the story of the capture of Bin Laden. And then it went through all the, the different uh, advisors. And each one was saying, oh, the probability of Bin Laden in being that building okay. is 20%. So, and the other side mm-hmm. is no, six. That's okay. the so, so, if I, so if I understand you correctly, the, the challenge is when we're thinking about the future, 
and we're assigning probabilities to things that might happen in the future. There's always um, a set of our own beliefs that we are putting onto that estimation. Is that what you're saying? Is that the shift that, and, yes. and so we're, and so yes, Bayesian analysis. Yes. So, so the way that, so, what, so I'm just trying to, um, so I understand. So what you're saying is that whenever we're doing estimates, forecasts, uh, whatever the, the things are, which all these tools that are, that are used, they're used in AI, they're used in, um, modeling of, of uncertainty of risks, estimating all kinds of things. They get very, very fancy. They're getting, becoming even more and more powerful. The stuff that you talk about World War II, you can do on your phone now. But what, what you're saying is, if I understand you correctly, is at the heart of all of that, there is a projection of personal or some, some sub, sort of subjective beliefs or values, whether that's overtly or covertly, that somehow we're, we, we put that into these models and that's what we're forgetting. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. uh, let, let's uh, also uh, remind that these was ideas were in the 90s, 50s. So all this technology sure. was not there present. It was, and B was more within the, the framework of decision making mm -hmm. of the economic mm -hmm. models. So they were already talking about this utility mm -hmm. function, maximizing and so on. But people were starting to understand there's always going to be an element of uh, belief of your own experience when you make mm -hmm. a decision. So it was like from that mm -hmm. angle of your own decision making, how, how people are best to make decisions based on their mm -hmm. beliefs and how to do that in a more mm -hmm. rational mm -hmm. way. So that was like the foundations as to somehow reduce the uncertainty right. when you are making certain decisions, yes. but knowing that these probabilities or this kind of, um, when it comes to a decision, there, there's things that are hindrance to your own beliefs because we are not no longer talking about objective. Mm -hmm. We are talking about mm -hmm. objective, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. feelings mm -hmm. in particular. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was like the main ideas. Right. So there's always an element of feelings of Good. human, of human emotion, in, I guess, in any human endeavor. It, it was part yeah. of that, right? So it is in a bigger context. It's, it's like people at the end of the day, they need to make decisions like all of yeah. us. We are not yes. robots. So we are talking about mathematicians, uh, statisticians and uh, philosophers mm -hmm. that they, they understand mm -hmm. that, that they are not robots. Mm -hmm. Uh, that the world cannot be quantified yes. uh, in a way uh, as much as you'd like mm -hmm. to, uh, but there's a certain level yeah. of yeah, yeah. Um, experience that we put that make us mm. think. Uh, oh, it was just like terminate because then what what is Bayesian thinking allows mm. to do, which is was really really the turning mm. point in terms of other types of decision making, is that through your own experience. I remember like how the Enigma mm -hmm. code was cracked. You start to do some experience mm -hmm. based on that experience, you get a feedback, then you improve, and then you get the, all the time you mm -hmm. get your code cracked. In the same way, you start to make a decisions and you're going to make mistakes, but those mistakes giving you information. And you get from that feedback, then the next time you have to do a similar decision, your kind of probability or your beliefs are going to be fine tuned in a better way. So it is a way to update your beliefs as knowledge. So that next time you're going to do it in a better way. So as if you don't have to start from zero, but as well, you don't have to do in a linear. The learning is not linear. It's actually, it can be much faster if you apply this kind of uh, Bayesian inference or thinking in a proper way. So that was really the tool. It was designed to make decisions in uncertainty, mm -hmm. then, then exploded into all the concepts of, you know, AI and so on. Okay. So could you talk a bit more about some of the, so the, the problems with that or the, the challenges with, with that, if you could maybe summarize or just explain, I've seen your LinkedIn posts about Bayesian thinking, uh, where that mm -hmm. gets us into some trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As anything like uh, credit models or even mm -hmm. science, it's always, yeah, it's something. an approximation of the world. It's what not I the was world. finding is that it's even more than that. It, like it, it's, it's just, it's, it's just, it's, it's self-contained. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it can become a dog mm -hmm. in a way. So, and I was actually surprised is that the people that are supposed to be experts, and I'm sorry to say this, uh, they were talking in this in a very dogmatic way, in the same way that um, and the other ones in back in 2000 or before that were very dogmatic about their own models. I was like, hang on a second, there's something here mm -hmm. is not right. So you see the, the, the patterns here that you are mm. already seeing throughout mm. <laughs> all these different fields. The patterns is always the same, right? Uh, 
what is wrong? And obviously, there are people who are aware of that, but they are not aware that as as should be like the most of the practitioners. Mm-hmm. And one of these things is that is based on so-called priors, which you have to start with a certain understanding of the world, okay. of the hypothesis in that way, of a certain belief. So it starts always from prior belief. Now, if your prior belief is in a certain way that it makes interpret the data in that certain way, and it continues to mm. do that, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, mm. right? Then you start to see the world only through that perspective right. and it starts to compound mm. that, right? So that is one. It, it can become, mm. and it has been proven, it's not like just talking, mm. you can see these things can become a, a dogma. The second thing is is a bit more fundamental, is like, it is based on that concept that knowledge is belief, mm-hmm. it's based on belief, and it's all going back to Plato again, mm-hmm. it's very interesting to understand the history of mm-hmm. the field anthropology of thinking mm-hmm. and so on. But then actually people realize it was after uh, the Bayesian thinking founders uh, that actually uh, not all knowledge has to be coming from beliefs mm. and uh, not all beliefs are knowledge. So these are the tremendous uh, the implications. But as we can see here as well, that, uh, you know, like you, you, it's just not about beliefs. It's more than that. It's the experience. As mm-hmm. we started to talk about that, it's nothing to do with the belief. Mm-hmm. So, for example, thinking outside the box. Even if you believe you can think outside the box, it doesn't make you to think outside the box. You mm-hmm. need to know how. Mm-hmm. Right? It's an experience, not mm-hmm. a belief. And the other one is, to me, which is probably the most critical, is that, and again, it's like the founders, they were very smart people, mm-hmm. right? They were to, and, and the process, by the way, the process of the Bayesian inference was itself a, create, a creative mm-hmm. process, an imagination. Mm-hmm. We're talking here about mm-hmm. creating something, mm-hmm. which what I'm trying to say is that the people who formulate Bayesian thinking, they will not be able to achieve to that formation by using Bayesian thinking. Right. <laughs> See the contradiction mm. here. Right. So <laughs> they have to go through right. other levels of right. yeah. thinking. Mm. And, and the thing is like, it becomes like as in organizations that you have to quantify, it's about all the explicit knowledge, mm. not the intuitions, and, and so on and so on. It becomes so driven into that perspective of the risk and quantifying and so on. In the same way that rationality and this was like more on back in the 2000s that start because of the ai and there was all these gurus and, and become all the less be bayesian thinkers because it's like the ultimate way of being rational but by doing so you what you are saying is like oh, whatever it is not bayesian it's not rational and to be rational it can only be bayesian right it's almost getting into that extreme mm-hmm. and, and what it does is that it prevents you in a way to also use other modes of thinking like creativity mm-hmm. and leaps of imagination and these kind of things that they are outside the Bayesian, mm. right? So that is like where I have a, a certain conflict and, and people, okay, fine, Bayesian is just a tool. Plus the problem is like as all the way back, you can see all these patterns here, like string theory, this is the only way. All the funding is like putting into that kind of uh, one direction, and everybody is doing this because the others are doing as mm-hmm. well. And this kind of, uh, you know, removing the, as that ability to think in other ways because are just deemed as not relevant as they are with Bayesian because now everything is Bayesian, everything has to be rational, right. has to be quantified, and you can see here it's a self-fulfilling spiral. Yeah, yeah. And that's the problem. I yeah, have. yeah, and same thing as that lead them to. Yeah. 2008 crisis. Right. And I, I see this also, I see this <laughs> in the risk space uh, an awful lot. Um, Monte Carlo analysis, for example, like the, which are these complex models. And if something isn't right, it, it, I even have a book here, how to measure anything, which, um, I yeah. know the book. <laughs> and, and just because you can do it doesn't mean that it's a good idea to do it. Um, and, uh, the solution to models not being right isn't necessarily getting you know a better model or a more accurate distribution curve, if you like. Um, it, sometimes that the there are you know, it's good to understand the limitations of, of of this thinking, which I think is what you're bringing here to this um, conversation. And so with that, hmm, it, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. If I if Please. I may, it, it, it's because this actually is it, quite crucial because this really needs to be. Set set in a very specific way. It's, yes, it is knowing the lessons, right? And 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 people when they listen to this, and I know it's, it's human nature. 
Oh, yeah, of course. Models have limited tick box, move on. What does it this mean? Is that people are constrained by this way of thinking, that they don't even realize the constraint that they are getting into. So when they are saying models are have limits, they are constrained by thinking the model way. Hmm. So they are just saying by by the sake of saying. Right. It's like you think, oh, you can think in a lateral thinking. Yeah, but how do mm. you do that? What I'm trying to say here is like because institutions and everybody is like the quantified and, you know, all these data scientists is very good. I mean, what they of are course. doing is of very course. good. Mm -hmm. The downside is that it, it, it limits people to only thinking that way. And even if you tell them, oh, those are uh, limitations, they say, yeah, of course, there are more limitations, but they continue yeah. to do that. They, they, they're not, not able to think in other ways because other ways of thinking have been lost. Mm. You know, they're not being practiced. And we're talking about diversity and so on. I, I'm sorry. I mean, the, the biggest diversity is, is in our mm -hmm. brain and no one is talking about that, right? So you go to an institution, are they even aware of this negative capability mm -hmm. or you know, let alone uh, lateral thinking? And they say, yeah, yeah, you know, like have the, the scrums or mm -hmm. like imagination. But the way they are doing it is just like, it's just very superficial. Mm. It's predominantly, is like the coding and the, the models and so on and so on. And that constrains the individual mm. here, right? No matter how you... Yes. They say it's T really tell, tell me a little bit more about other ways of thinking. Um, tell, tell me a, a little bit more about some maybe other techniques to make decisions or to think creatively. Um, I imagine there's a whole range of things, but you know, there's all kinds of things that might come from I don't know. They might come from theater. They might come from other disciplines. You know, what what are some of the mm. w ways to think differently? So one of them you just mentioned the improvisation for, right? Uh, so that is uh, them. There's another. Uh, if you if you wanted to think about uh, understanding your dreams, mm. you know, <laughs> you yeah. can think about that. Like actually, a lot of uh, many some some not say many, but some of the the findings that changed history was through the sure. discoveries and people sure. were sleeping, right? So. Uh, so if there's another one, uh, there's also like this, uh, the glimpse of, um, uh, so this is actually more like that perception that you say it that mm. way, but you, you just don't feel comfortable. Yeah. It's something there that is not quite yes. right. And this is what, what, what I, you know, we, we should be exploring more that. So that's what I do as well with, uh, you know, with people I work with, you explore that I'll call it the glimpse in mm. lights. They are not really kind of verbalized, mm -hmm. let alone in a quantified. Yeah, fight. yeah. But there are certain things that is in there, yeah. you know? And we need to go through a process that then involves like all these different mm -hmm. tools we're going through, but also be aware of uh, the, the enemies, like this need to uh, be certain mm -hmm. and so on. That makes you able to have this exploratory. And to be quite frank, it ends up to be, you have to be curious. Mm -hmm. If, if you stop being curious because, you know, the job that you are doing, it's just not fulfilling. You are just doing this mm -hmm. because, you know, whatever, you have to build a report and you stop questioning. That's the old problem. Mm -hmm. When people talking about, you know, all these organizations and they have like uh, the pizza lunch and so on and so on. But are really people interacting yeah. with their job do they actually like it to be in a level that they, they like so much i'm not even going to this love what to do i'm not, it's not mm. what i'm saying it's like to be curious mm. to question you know to not be afraid to question all the things that you are taking for granted because that's that's when you're going to find all these tools mm. so instead of you know saying all these different tools to be quite frank the, the one of the top tools is to be curious. Mm. And now we are going to improve that. That's a different question. That is like I said, like probably one of you know the most important tool in a way. Mm. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot so much good stuff there. And sometimes it's you know to be bored. To to not do anything, actually. <laughs> uh, there are moments of like it's not like mm. okay, team, we're going to spend 20 minutes being creative and or getting like it doesn't you know, the, it doesn't work like that. The brain, the subconscious, uh, you know, sometimes a great idea. That's why going for a walk sometimes is a, like the best thing you could do or, you know, going for a run or, or whatever, like a, a good idea may appear at a moment where mm -hmm. it just, it just happens to appear. And the way the brain works is still mm -hmm. 
not fully understood, still quite mysterious. Mm -hmm. And sometimes mm -hmm. you, you know, there is that creative process of like giving your brain a little, a problem and stepping away. And then at some point you come back mm -hmm. and oh, there's the solution mm -hmm. or there's a new idea or what have you. And, mm -hmm. and we need to build some of those moments much more, especially now in the world of social media and overstimulation. And there's always something that we can occupy mm -hmm. our minds with, but sometimes it's just not having that, like removing, <laughs> removing those things and seeing what happens. And, and you see, like, like most of when you go to social media spokes just about, um, particularly mm -hmm. LinkedIn and so on, we see a lot of techniques about being high performance, mm -hmm. you know, the Pomodoro, the Heisenhower matrix mm -hmm. and all these kind of things, you know. Uh, but we rarely see of, uh, so-called techniques so to be uh, even more creative. And, uh, for example, it, it's not like a totally, mm -hmm random process for example now it is a, a personal like as meditation in a way is a personal mm. thing that worked for me do not work for you but is ex exploratory and they can and for example i know not always certain but i have a, a good level of confidence when that i'm going to run and after 45 minutes precisely when i'm going to stop running and it's like maybe mm. the body is like going on transformation i come up with an idea that i was struggling to find so I know by by running that there's the advantage as well of coming up with insight. Does it work for everybody? No, mm -hmm. absolutely not. Maybe other people are on the shower. I don't mm -hmm. know. But as you start to explore more of that, you actually start to find patterns and you actually start mm -hmm. to not control, but understand mm -hmm. more about yourself. And actually this kind of creativity doesn't have to be totally uncertain, mm -hmm. totally okay. random. Mm -hmm. There's a level of, uh, you could just yeah this like yeah. Ed, Ed de Bono like for example the father of lateral mm. thinking has a lot of process in a mm. way to exercise your lateral thinking so there's like a, a lot of tools right. as well on that area and I think you can design environments to improve that right mm. uh, there are ways to mm -hmm. or changing mm -hmm. your environment yeah as you say there are practices that one can develop that um, mm -hmm. enhance creativity and lateral thinking so you know that's so that's really that's great yeah. stuff um, so. I wanted to also touch on to yet a post about stoicism and I wanted to talk a little yeah. bit about stoicism because stoicism is having a moment and I, I like stoicism. I read uh, Ryan Holiday has made mm -hmm. quite a big, you know, career mm -hmm. about writing books about stoicism mm -hmm. and I, I like his stuff. And, uh, but you, you had a post about stoicism. It's almost becoming, perhaps it's becoming also a dogma because of its popularity. Um, I'm wondering mm -hmm. what you, what you think about stoicism where where um where that mm -hmm. post came from where those ideas came from for you ah, right yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh so i i also uh read the, the books mm -hmm. you mentioned uh am i a, a stoic uh i don't consider myself as a stoic but i don't consider myself um, being anything mm -hmm. in particular do i use stoicism certain yeah i can use some some of that but again it's uh same thing as before we kind of need to understand where these ideas are coming from right and and if you go back where this stoicism, uh, uh, it was done in a yes in a period of high anxiety for the people that were living. This was after like Alexander Great that the uh, all the empire collapsed and all of a sudden people are very anxious. What's going to be tomorrow? Uh, and then the stoicism, which basically start with uh, Zeno, was like kind of a cynic, and then he mixed with the Plato mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, argumentation. From, it's kind of a mix of the, these two branch of philosophies all coming from Aristotle. So mm -hmm. I'm going to stop mm -hmm. here. But uh, the process of the Stoicism has a context, right? Mm -hmm. right? And it has when philosophy become a bit of a, a therapeutic, therapeutic uh, mm -hmm. process as well to, to, to heal mm -hmm. the soul in a way. And by the way, just an a caveat, all this, uh, the CBT, the Cognitive Behavioral Therapy that is even used on uh, NHS and uh, in any, many medical mm -hmm. institutions, the cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, the foundations actually is coming from the, the stoicism. So the, the founders of the cognitive behavioral therapy, that is not mm. like people are practicing that in a, when they go to the therapy paid or, or free without knowing they're actually yeah. way practicing right. stoicism. Um, these, these are our ideas that come from a context. And so we are talking about a context of, uh, you know, before Christ, like more than thousand years ago where the world was completely different yes people were going through anxiety but the world was completely different first of all and and the second it, it was not even technology right so the main thing that i i'm i'm a bit always from the beginning is like 
you control what you can control and you cannot just mm. you know what you cannot control you just let it go and be in mm. peace with it you know very beautiful you know and i tried to apply it <laughs> to some extent it's not only that it's because the world mm. as of mm. today has become so yes. complex yes. so yes. intertwined and you can think about is uh, the world deterministic as kind of the stoics kind of believe or is more kind of uncertain mm. where this butterfly mm. effect as the butterfly mm. the wings on japan cause a hurricane in uh, florida yeah. all this chaos all this interconnection mm. how is my impact uh, in in uh, creating say a, a post on linkedin will have a, an effect of someone else that is on the other side of, of the world So this kind of the thing, the control. There's the a of continuum of control, isn't there? Control. And and here's here's also where I, I like my, my own kind of practices that start to become challenging. So there are things you can't control, fine, but the things that you can, how I feel about something. Um, but that that middle, there's a there's there's a continuum, and there are things that you can influence, right? And that's where that's where um, mm -hmm. I'm like like fuck you brain <laughs> like like it's sort of um where uh, especially I, i'm thinking professionally but but i can think of many contexts where it's like well i can't control this but maybe i can influence it maybe i can do and, and yeah you you know you never really know where you can and can and as you say the world is far more complex now that it's hard to determine it's not it's not a linear boundary of like control mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. You know, you can't, there's, there's so many things where like, oh, maybe I can kind of like, I don't know, influence the, influence the market that I'm in, influence the, influence that person, influence mm -hmm. what, what, and that's where it, it gets uh, very, very um, challenging because you, or even like you talk about reputation, reputational risk, right? Or re reputation mm -hmm. management or this sort of like, mm -hmm. it can influence it, I suppose. So stoicism becomes very mm -hmm. challenging in that context. So I, I really resonate with what you're saying. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's very useful. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and just like kind of a, to spice it up as mm. well. I mean, if you go back to the slice, mm. you know, if you're going to ask them, oh, can you control the weather? Mm. Of mm. course not. You know, my crop my, right. is going to be, I cannot have influence on right. the weather. Now you're going back to today's age. Mm. It has a huge conflict right. because then you are told, or oh, actually you are controlling yes. the weather, yeah, you know, yeah. because of the climate yeah. change. So it's a huge contradiction, mm -hmm. right? So, so I should give up of not trying to modify because actually I don't control the weather. Right. So I should give up or actually I have some level of influence, as you said. So is, is, I'm not like, you know, avoiding any kind of, you know, whoever agrees or not on the climate change. What's the message here is that the world as of mm -hmm. today, far, far, far more intertwined, complex, uncertain than it was at the time. That was the, the first mm -hmm. element of my... It's not, you can adapt, by the way. These, all these philosophies, the philosophers at the time, they were actually adapting right. ideas before. And the, 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 the problem is that we stop adapting mm -hmm. things. Well, we just take ancient wisdom and then we just use it as yes. it is. And it becomes, as I said, a bit yes. dogma. Yeah. Well, the philosophers, like Ian, is actually... Is an adaptation of ideas. Mm -hmm. all, all these kind of philosophies were being adapted before for other philosophies. All these is ideas that you, you can adapt mm -hmm. yourself, right? And then you can reconstruct. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the, 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 the first, second thing. And the first is about that element, again, of the creativity. So again, we are at the back in the time, we we're talking about people that were really suffering on, on their lives. So things were so completely out of control. And obviously, to avoid the anxiety, okay, mm -hmm. so if you cannot control, let's uh, be in peace with that. Fine. Where does the element of creativity comes into mm -hmm. play with uh, the stoicism? Uh, so that's what I'm referring about in the post, maybe referring to this creative resilience, because everybody talks about the resilience mm -hmm. and they link, oh, let's be stoic. Well, Okay, but how? Where is the creativity? Where not only we probably can control or influence more than what we can think, but also think in ways to be in a creative mm. way that we can use our resources in a more in a better way. And all of a sudden, instead of talking about, by all means, we should be talking about poly crisis, mm. but why we're not talking about uh, poly creativity, mm. for example? Mm. <laughs> so it's just mm -hmm. another topic. Mm -hmm. you know? 
uh, or the other way I read the other day is like the collapsology. There's another term. That collapsology, right. Mm-hmm. It's collapso- mm-hmm. Collapsology, right? And it's okay, but maybe we should also be talking about the creatology. Mm-hmm. So, because it's both of them. It's like all these yes. concepts, uncertainty needs to be managed, control, mm-hmm. uncertainty needs to be crunched. Anyway, mm-hmm. so I stop here. That was like yeah. very good. Yeah. The Stoics philosophers, it was never their intention to be a dogma. Mm-hmm philosophy always has been a transformation ideas mm. and we why don't we continue that work you know that's the only remark oh great uh, I, I love it it's it's good this is good stuff i want to talk about the university of uncertainty a little bit more and what it is mm. and why you set this up and some of the things that you do with it mm-hmm. if you could explain that mm-hmm. uh, that would be mm-hmm. really helpful yeah, the, the name was a bit uh, thought-provoking in a way. Uh, so this was actually coming from... Um, I was like looking into uh, um, some conference that uh, George Soros was doing in, in London. And by the way, I like George Soros, there's like good things, bad things about him. So as, as mm-hmm. everything, right? But there was he was referring about uh, these uh, universities that are teaching dogmas. Mm-hmm. We should be teaching uncertainties, which is very contradicting. Mm-hmm. So it, uh, the name was coming from that, just uh, mm-hmm. for your audience uh, to to be aware, because university and uncertainty mm-hmm. they, they clash, right. right? But that was the purpose. Now I have like kind of a uh, program. I wanted to explore more of that. It is not a curriculum. It doesn't have the goals. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have like these things. Oh, you need to study these and you get the certificate. You don't. So you don't get um, a certificate of professional development. You don't give hours of <laughs> like. Uh, <laughs> Oh, no, I'm yeah, sorry for yeah. that. <laughs> I don't have accountability either. I don't have Pomodoro mm-hmm. techniques. You know, joke mm-hmm. apart. Uh, it's 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 kind of a way to have that experience because all this kind of decision making and uncertainty, mm-hmm. again, is very personal, mm-hmm. right? In a way, as much you can understand the models and the numbers and so on, at the end of the day, it's going to be personal. Whoever is in the top leadership, is not going to just throw you she. Mm. Going to just to trust on analysts, the data scientists, or whatever quants are reporting to him or she. There's always going to be an element of belief, intuition, mm. and so on, even if they want to say. And, and this is kind of a more an, a, a participatory kind of uh, exploration with uncertainty. You can think as a laboratory mm. in a way, your work. That will allow people to have a better understanding not only of themselves, but how to navigate this uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And therefore, is a kind of uh, program, if you mm-hmm. wish, not a step by step, nothing like that, but it has like a bit of a journey, mm-hmm. and and I use as well in terms of specifically to help them connect the dots, their dots. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I've been referring to that is like some glimpse of insights or some experience that you have, and it does not really make sense. So we're talking about a bit of two hours sense making in a way, but these are these experience idea not quite there, mm-hmm. not we're very well verbalized, some kind of mm-hmm. insights or, you know, and then we, we're going through ability for you to start to connect those dots. And, and, and the only way to do that is going through a level of a certain, mm-hmm. there's no way that you're going to unify by a straight line. Mm-hmm. So you have to go through that level of exploration mm-hmm. and then it starts to, you know, first diverge and then it starts mm-hmm. to converge a bit of diverge from version mm-hmm. thinking in a way, kind of. And along the way, I put what are so-called enemies, what are the things that mm. will uh, people will fall for that, like this need for closure, mm. which is like the need for certainty. Mm. I wanted to make a quick, uh, to be certain instead of being sitting on. So there's like to people to be aware, mm. not only of be aware, but also to understand how to navigate this mm. on a personal level that, you know, obviously it depends on, on the person and their level of curiosity and openness. And, uh, you know, like a lot of people are finding this extremely valuable because then they can translate into their professional and mm-hmm. life experience and so on. And the others, unfortunately, they, you know, it's because, and I don't blame them, you know, obviously my problem has always been in an improvement, but there's a huge uh, barrier here, uh, which is very conditioned uh, by the, the educational system. Mm-hmm basically, uh, by the corporate system that we have to have the goals, we have to have the curriculum, we have to achieve mm-hmm. that, the smart goals, and it's about uh, high performance. And, and it's very difficult for someone, people that are in that level of mm-hmm. doing things to 
all the standard to move into a different area yeah. as much as preparation. But yeah, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, it can happen. I'm not going to say that it works for everybody, but for those that are able to go through, they, it becomes like transformational, and uh, and I'm 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 pleased with that result. But it's uh, you know, it just doesn't going to work mm. for everybody at that moment in their lives. Uh, mm. That. And there's nothing wrong with the person, by right. the way. This, that's why I don't have certificates. Right. It's not a failure. It's just because it's the moment of the life, yes. whatever, yes. for any reason. So they can try it later yes. again, right? So it, 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 that's why it's very personal. Mm -hmm. It's very it's difficult and quantify, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> All these kind of things. That yeah, no, that's, that's a lot of sense. Um, and I think sometimes we're in search of the right answer or the, you know, there's something kind of comforting, mm. but then we have to take a step back and say, well, has that actually served me throughout my, throughout my life? If I've operated with that, um, mm. you know, with that mindset, uh, I wanted to just, I'm conscious of time, but I wanted to touch on running and your, so hundred K run. I've never <laughs> run a hundred K I've, I have done one ultra marathon, but that was just under 50 K for me. So, 100k sound quite daunting you just talk to me about that and what you know how you got into running in the first place and what that has to do with anything good question uh, i i always run uh not as long mm -hmm. distance maybe a tune and so on then i started to exercise by the way i was kind of almost getting obese and then it was like a period that i started then to go to the mm -hmm. gym then i uh, got myself slim and so on so I like this transformation and so on but then it was like in actually in a uh, Christmas of 15, right? It was just before the COVID. Mm. Oh, no, I mean, I was not actually one of these things that I was not see coming, right? Uh, but for some reason, I was like this glimpse of insight, maybe <laughs> this intuition that I was like, thinking, the world is just going, you know, at least in my perspective, it was going to fine, you know, even my uh, things in my life were just, they were going to fine. You know, we're going to find is something that maybe a crisis mm. um, because of my previous experience. And so I like this idea because I was uh, reading some David Goggins, you know, I'm not sure if mm -hmm. your audience knows about this extreme uh, runner and so on. So obviously I was influenced uh, <laughs> by, by him. And it makes me like to think, okay, you know what? For uh, 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 I'm going to make an ultra marathon because of David mm -hmm. Goggins. And also the, the reason was like to mentalize myself okay. to something, a potential danger that might have come with i don't know how but i was like mm -hmm. that so that was the idea then i i was actually not as well in shape so i started to run slowly five ten and so on and so on and it was like the main purpose right and then the COVID happened uh, and then I, all of a sudden i was running uh, alone in, in london completely empty mm -hmm. i was the only mm -hmm. one running at oxford street mm -hmm. and the can <laughs> the you know uh, mm -hmm. and so on uh, and then uh, it was also, obviously, it was also for the cancer research, mm -hmm. so I like a bit of uh, sponsor to them. Um, I was going to be on that run between uh, uh, London and Brighton, mm -hmm. but it was canceled because of the, mm -hmm. uh, the COVID. But I start, I, I continue my, uh, um, you know, my, my training. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a different level of thinking. It's about more on the spike resilience, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so you know where to go. You just have to go there mm. <laughs> and have to go and yeah. go through the pain, mm. basically. Mm. That's what it is, basically. Mm. Right? And, and, you know, like I think he ended up in, a, he was, I think, in a bank holidays around the May, mm. which I did this ultra marathon pretty much in London. I was doing okay. it by myself. It was a launch. Okay. There was no official competition mm. because it was the COVID. So I did it uh, myself. I register. I have mm. still, uh, you know, the data, mm. 100 kilometers, fine. I know where uh, it was a lot of yeah. pain and mm. so on. And, and, and looking back, it was not necessarily the COVID situation, the crisis. No, I, I don't want to get into, you know, personal levels mm -hmm. and so on, but actually the crisis that uh, was kind of coming was actually my, so I was in a relationship for uh, mm. 20 years and that, that collapsed basically during the COVID. Mm. And I have to say, maybe if it wasn't for that running mm. the, the ultra marathon to, you know, like, Mm. Being that kind of resilience of the the pain and the fear right. and so on, I probably could have collapsed myself going through this, uh, wow. mm. you know, other pain. Mm. Yes, it, it was kind of an aside, mm. you know, that mm. was like just to, yeah. <laughs> just to give you yeah. the, the personal. Aspect. I understand. Um, mm. You still run? Do you run regularly? 
I do. Uh, well, actually, I, as of today, I have a slightly injury, okay. so I cannot run tomorrow, but I usually mm-hmm. try to run maybe 10 tours mm-hmm. every week and you're mm-hmm. there. But uh, at the same time, um, I'm conscious that uh, when I did the, the ultra marathon, I was about, uh, I was 45, 46. Mm-hmm. So yeah, 45, something like that. No, I, I'm like <laughs> older. Uh, and the things are, I mean, it's just like, you know, body it just does respond mm-hmm. as well. So if I would be running another ultramarathon, no. Uh, and the main reason I'll have to say uh, is because actually my father is a doctor and mm. other people have caught my attention mm. to that. Uh, doing these extreme type of things uh, actually can make a heart attack mm. and there's consequence. And because of this COVID and mm-hmm. vaccinations, you know, I just don't unnecessary risks because mm-hmm. then just that doesn't have the purpose. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just because, mm-hmm. oh, I'm just running for a certificate yeah. of 100 kilometers. Yeah. The purpose at the time was because of that. Right. I don't have that purpose anymore. Yes, I exercise because mm-hmm. it's more about a tool mm-hmm. uh, of creativity. Mm-hmm. In a way. My meditation. Yeah, that, no, that's fabulous. I, I think that um, the, there's a line, right? Once you get into ultra stuff, it's not healthy, right? There's a, there's an unhealthy line. I cycle and I know some cyclists as well that they, they go hard, they, they cycle too hard, um, and get into Mm -hmm. difficulties. And atrial fibrillation is a problem, uh, with, with Mm -hmm. a lot of endurance athletes. Uh, Yes. I think uh, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a line of the, the healthy, unhealthy. It's a non-linear relationship. Like more running does not lead to more health. (laughs) There's a, there's a point Mm -hmm. where, Mm-hmm. It gets to, um, it can be damaging, right? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously people take risks, mm-hmm. right? I'm not saying that you should not be mm-hmm. running and so on. But there's like, there was a, for me, it was there was a purpose. Yes. It was not just mm-hmm. like a, a title or to get mm-hmm. slim or, or to show off. Mm-hmm. It was nothing like that because I actually was doing this by yeah. myself, you know? Mm-hmm. Fair enough. I was like for uh, uh, the cancer uh, mm-hmm. research that was a bit of uh, helping mm-hmm. the money and the funding. Uh, but it was really like, mm-hmm. There was a purpose. Uh, I don't know they have that same purpose. Mm-hmm. Yes, I run, but to me, it's just not necessary to be in that extreme level. Mm-hmm. It was like Im- very important because of what I just mentioned mm-hmm. for that sake mm-hmm. of coincidence, yeah. empathy, whatever you call yeah. it. Oh, it's fabulous. Running's great as well. And there is something, as you say, purpose. I, I think it ultra as well. I've just said, you know, it's, 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 it's unhealthy. I think to do too much of it is unhealthy. Um, but there's also, uh, mm. an exploration of like the body's limits too, that I find super interesting. And mm. there is some, there is a healthy aspect, like a mental, mm. mentally very healthy aspect of trying to mm. explore mental. the, you know, the limits of your, of your body. And, um, they're always more, the limits are far greater than, you know, you, than we sometimes think we often mm. think, and we can achieve much more than we originally thought we were capable of. And all of that's yeah, it's all great. That's all great. But um, yeah, there is also uh, mm-hmm. like anything, it can become an, an addiction, right? So, um, or we attach an identity, like you say, like I'm yeah. a runner, so I have to be run, like I have to be running all the time or, you know, Correct. sort of thing. And that, that can be unhealthy because that can be a detriment to other parts of your life. So that's the other thing. It becomes, can become a dogma, mm-hmm. right? It so, becomes a dogma. Uh, you know, yeah. it's fine for a lifestyle. If I'm not, yeah. Mm-hmm. But, it just it's, it did serve mm-hmm. me uh, for that time. Yes, I continued to run, but in a different purpose. It's more for the creativity, for as as a meditation, because mm-hmm. I cannot mindfulness. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't work sure. for me. So I do running. Sure. Uh, it has like other events. Fantastic, Nuno. I, I think we've covered so much. But was there anything that you wanted to mention or cover before we wrap up? No, I think I think maybe just a, a quick one because we we haven't talked. The leadership, which was another area, okay. uh, because there's also this work of uh, Amy Admerson mm. about the failure, because there's like we're going through the uncertainty, it requires a, mm. a certain level of failure, and there's all these discussions mm. about failing fast and failing safe mm. and so on. So on. Uh, I just wanted to say this, like this, again, the dogmas about fail fast, fail safe. Well, actually, it might not be exactly that. So there's all no new uh, kind of research uh, by Amy Admerson. Just I wanted just to refer about that. What I'm trying to say here is like keeping questioning all of these things to me is the critical, mm. you know, at each thing, you know, ultramarathon models, Asian, each one of these things have a context, mm. have like a purpose in that context. But at the end of the day, we, we should always be kind of a questioning them because these things need to be adapted. And, and when they were created by all these people, 
they, they, I, I doubt that they were thinking this playing that level it, they because they created mm-hmm. from other uh, fellowships. Yes. So, so it is that that I, I see a sense of unfortunately people losing kind of that ability mm-hmm. for different reasons, and that that's the thing I wanted to mm. really give um, not hope, but really understand that people actually are more experts than what they think are. You know, like trying to understand their uniqueness, their Mm. internal expertise, not be relying so much on these external experts, but also start to understand more your internal expertise and come up with your things. You actually realize that you are doing a lot more than your uh, sphere of control, Mm. very limited and actually can have a better, a bigger impact, bigger influence. Mm. Uh, I think this is what I I wanted to give to your audience that actually have more control what the stoicism are saying and also, but it is about questioning the things, mm. redefining, changing creativity, imagination, and so on and so on. Fantastic. I think that's uh, a great place to wrap up. Um, for people that enjoyed this and want to maybe follow you or get in touch or learn a bit more about your work, what are the best ways to do that? Mm. Yeah, at the moment, uh, the, the best contact uh, is on the LinkedIn. So I'm not sure if you're going to put some uh, link. Put them in the show notes, sure, sure. Uh, I can give you to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Then I have like some, uh, you know, uh, demi website um, uh, where people wanted to understand a bit more about, uh, you know, the work mm-hmm. or uh, these uh, cohorts, they, uh, they can do so. But predominantly, uh, I'm a LinkedIn. Uh, not that I, I, anyway, so I'm on LinkedIn. Okay, great. Eight methods, great. And I'll provide an, another link if you want to share. Great. Fabulous, Nuno. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this. This is a great conversation. Really enjoyed it. All right. No, appreciate myself. Really. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me.